So thank you everybody for being here. Um, before we start, since this is my last week over here, I just wanted to acknowledge, uh, to, to, to thank all the organizers, the organizers of the workshop, the organizers of this whole program, uh, the Simons Foundations also for supporting my visit here. So this has been like a great program. I'm actually sad that I'm leaving. Uh, whoever is staying longer, please enjoy it. It's very nice. And what I'm gonna talk about today is, um, is just a recent work uh, that is joined with uh, Tamara, Bob and Ken that are in the audience over here and Alexander Minakov. Uh, who will be here. I saw his name as a list of participants. And uh, we're gonna talk about the soliton versus the gas. So we are studying uh, the interaction between a single soliton and a gas of solitons that actually here had already mentioned earlier. So that's why I asked them not to erase any of these boards because I'll probably point at them during the talk. Uh, so actually, thank you, Gerard, for giving this uh, fantastic uh, <laughs> description, uh, conference in description of KDV. So we're actually gonna focus on, on MKDV for uh, and one of the reasons was that precisely we have a matrix riemann hilbert problem, so it's easier, it's easier to, to study. But, uh, but the this, this whole analysis was also carried, part of the analysis that we did here was also carried uh, along on a previous paper on KDV. And uh, well, despite the technical difficulties, it could be uh, extended also for the case of the soliton and the gas, also for the KDV case, but we didn't do that. So we're gonna focus mostly on MKDV in this talk. So what is the MKDV? So it's the focus is the focusing modified KDV equation. So you can see, yeah, this is working. You can see the equation up here. So instead of having just Q here, we have a Q squared. So this is the this is the difference between KDV and MKDV. And it's still an integrable PDE. So it arises from the compatibility conditions of these two lax operators. So uh, this the first one. So basically it means that there is a simultaneous solution of these two first order ODEs. These are metric solutions. And the first one is the one that is associated with the Schrodinger operator that Kerr was mentioning. From there, we can, we can calculate all the spectrum data and so on. And then the second equation over here basically gives the, it's, it's the evolution operator that tells us how the solution should evolve in time. And so the compatibility condition of these two, these two matrices gives us the solution of, is equivalent to solving uh, the MKDV equation. And this is just a little, a little video that shows when you have two soliton solutions that interact, the bigger one, it's overcoming the small one, and then it just passes through it. There is some sort of a elastic interaction as we would expect for MKDB. So what are the classical solutions? I already showed you in the previous video some soliton solutions. So we still have soliton arising, uh, a solution of MKDV. So these are rapidly increasing localized traveling waves. And the expression of the soliton, the single soliton solution is a hyperbolic secant that you can see over here uh, with velocity four kappa square. Kappa is a, a point in the, in the discrete spectrum. I have a sign of chi. So chi is the norming constant if you think in the, in the, in the spectrum setting. And uh, so what is interesting here is that we can have uh, positive bumps. So those are the solitons or negative bumps is the sign of chi is negative. So we have troughs. And these are the, the anti-soliton, they're called anti-soliton. So we can have both cases, unlike uh, the KDV case, where we only have one direction of the solitons. And uh, this X naught is just a phase shift that is related to the, to the spectral data in this, in this logarithmic form. Okay, and the, 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 the moving direction of both the soliton and anti-soliton is always in one direction, always towards the right, like it was in the KDV case. And uh, another classical solution is the periodic traveling wave solution. So it's an elliptic wave that has, uh, like also here it has some parameters, the A, the A1 and the B, the B is again the velocity, and it has this modulus M between zero and one. And this is the Jacobi elliptic function, some Jacobi elliptic function. Okay, so these are classical solutions. In general, this is the, the picture that was, I'm pointing here, but it's the, it's the, it's the blackboard behind that, uh, the, the, this is the picture that Gera also showed, showed. We have the initial condition and we wanna get from here to here to the evolved uh, profile of the, of the wave. Uh, instead of going directly here, we first do some direct scattering transform. We construct the Lux pair, we analyze the scattering data, which are the eigenvalues, the norming constants and the reflection coefficients. Then we evolve them. And then as Gera was saying, they evolve in a, in a linear fashion in a very explicit and linear fashion. So we find the scattering data at a later time. And then we get back using the inverse scattering techniques and uh, we're focusing on Riemann-Hilbert problems. So we're not using D 
the other equation, the Gelfand, Levitt, and Marchenko equation. We're not using that, we're just using Riemann Hilbert problem technique and solving it, or at least try to solve it. Um, so this is the general, the general recipe. And uh, what is specifically a soliton gas? So this is this is all classical. When we have classic, we want to look for classical solutions. And the soliton gas is something, let, let me give you first a, an informal intro, an informal definition, which is basically what happens if we have a lot of solitons, like a large number of solitons possibly picked at random in our initial configuration. So this is a this is a, a numerical simulation that was done by Shulgalin and Perinovsky. On the left, you can see the initial configuration. It's a lot of solitons that are sort of packed together. And then this is the, the time evolution. So this is all numerical. Uh, and you can see that all, you can sort of guess that there are a lot of lines that they're sort of interacting between each other, most likely pairwise. So it seems like the probability the three or more solitons collide is practically zero. So they're still interacting pairwise somehow. And so how do we describe this uh, rigorously and how do we define a soliton gas in a, in a rigorous way? So this is what happens. So uh, the first intuition is indeed the two solitons, when two solitons interact, they get a, a phase shift. And the, the phase shift has this form, has a logarithmic, uh, is in a logarithmic form. So here again, you see the same picture, that I, the, the same video that I showed you before, but here you can also see what happens to the velocity and to the acceleration. Right, so, so the velocity of both of the solitons remains constant, except when they're interacting that something funky is going on. But otherwise the, 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 the velocity stays constant, but there is a phase shift that both of the solitons receive from the interaction. So this is the first intuition. Second intuition is what happens if then, instead of just two, I have a whole line of solitons lined up and then there is a big soliton that just, just passing through them, exactly like in this picture. So this is another numerical simulation by Carbone, Dutic, and uh, Gennady, again from 2016, so from the same period. And so the idea is that I have these big solitons and it's passing through this, like, through this uh, collection of little guys. And you can see that, um, I hope you can see the, the color. So the red spike is actually the soliton as it's passing through, the, through this uh, collection of guys and it's re receiving a lot of phase shift. So clearly it's accelerating just because of the phase shift. It's not that it's changing the velocity officially. And then the red one is, uh, sorry, the black one is the soliton as if it's not encountering the little guys. So this is the soliton in the vacuum. And you can see precisely that there is some separation between the two. So, so, the, so the soliton passes through the gas, it's actually changing its velocity. It's actually accumulating some velocity and it's moving faster. So this is the second intuition. So from, two, from these two intuition actually comes the idea of a soliton gas. It was, it's an old idea, it's, it comes from Zakharov from the 70s where he actually had this intuition. Suppose that you have a dilute soliton gas, meaning you have all these little bumps, one next, one next to the other that they extend to infinity and you send a big soliton through them. So then the, the velocity of the soliton passing through this uh, gas of little soliton should satisfy this equation. You can see that here, this is really just a formula to calculate the velocity. And what you have is four kappa square, which is the velocity of the soliton as if it's in the vacuum. And then you have all of these accumulation of shifts that the soliton is accumulating from, from all, the, all the gas. Plus there is a, an extra condition to make sure that everything makes sense physically, which is this continuity equation for the density of the, of the soliton gas. Uh, this, was the first, this was the first results, but then later on, more recently, Gennady, well, 20 years ago, uh, Gennady also consider the, the case of a dense soliton gas. So dense means that basically you, don't, you cannot tell all the bumps apart. They are more condensated. So they're more packed together. So this is when the gas is dense. So the idea is that this row actually is not so small anymore. This density of solitons is not so small. And what happens is that then the velocity of the soliton passing through the gas satisfies a similar equation. But in this case, you can see that it's, a, it's an implicit equation. So I have V of K and V of K on both of the sides of the equation. While here I just said a kappa square and an S squared. Otherwise it's the same, uh, it's a similar formula. And again, you, you complement it with a, with a continuity equation. And uh, this is just the first result from 20, 2003, but then it was extended in several directions. Uh, the more recent ones are the paper by Gennady and Alex in 2020, and then uh, follow up by Alex and Fudon Wang, which I think he's talking on Friday. So there is more, there is more to it. It's not just this formula. There is more, more results that, uh, that belong to this uh, world of studying kinetic equations for describing a soliton through a gas or describing just a soliton gas. And um, so 
On the other hand, we can also think of a soliton gas, getting back to our informal definition, as just a, a, a bunch of solitons that are packed all together. And there are already some preliminary results about what happens if we take an infinite number of solitons. Is, does, is this still a solution of uh, KDV or MKDV? And does it even make sense? So there, is a, there are two papers in the 80s by Zaitsev and Witam, and then another one by Boyd, where they actually show that if I sum an infinite number of solitons of this form, hyperbolic secant square, and then they're actually, you can see that X minus and sigma, basically they're solitons that are identical and equally spaced. Well, this coincides with the elliptic solution of KDV. So this, this function makes sense. And then also in, in 92, Gestesi, Karkowski, and Zhao, they show that actually there exists an infinite soliton solution of KDV, provided that the, the spectral uh, parameters they have they, they have some, some properties. So in particular, the point spectrum, we're assuming that it's bounded. And basically the constants are little l2, the, the norming constant, little l2. So, so putting together these two points of view, one is what happens when a soliton goes through a gas, and the other one is what happens if we take a lot of solitons and then we pack them all together. We thought it's a, it's a, natural, defin it's a natural way, uh, like a natural way to define a soliton gas, and that's why we, we call it regular soliton gas, is the following. So a solution, to a nonlinear dispersive wave equation is a regular soliton gas if basically is the limit of an n soliton solution. And the average velocity of the soliton passing through this gas satisfies the kinetic equation that were derived by Zakharov and Gennady. Gennady L. So this is uh, our point, our starting point. So let me just give you uh, what we're actually going to talk about right now, so this was all the introduction, and this is, these are our results. This is a collection of our results that I'm gonna go through in details. So the first one is, let's construct indeed an, an uh, MKDV soliton gas. So we take an n soliton solution and we take a limit, and we're gonna find that in the limit, we have the, the solution is, can be written in terms of Fredon determinants. This is an exact expression. Uh, and then once we have the solution, we have a riemann hebel problem attached to it. We wanna study long time asymptotics. And uh, this is how the profile would look like well, at t equals zero and also at a large time. And it looks like something like that. So for x negatives is uh, exponentially small, the solution, and then for x positive, it behaves like a modulated, like an elliptic wave. And then once uh, we have the asymptotic of the gas, we add the soliton, right? Because we wanna also check what happens when the soliton goes through the gas. And uh, this is what we find out. We find out that the solution, when we have the gas plus the soliton, it actually decouples very linearly into an elliptic background, which is basically what you see up here, and then a soliton, like a bump that is passing through it. It's not gonna look like a, just a hyperbolic secant because there are all these, the interaction between the soliton and the gas that make the formula more complicated, but this is basically the contribution from the solitons. And then there is some error term that, uh, that comes from this long time asymptotics uh, analysis. And finally, we analyze the, the velocity of the soliton as it passes through the gas. And uh, I'm gonna explain better what this picture means. This is the velocity of the gas. Uh, sorry, the velocity of the soliton as it passes through the gas. Okay, so let's start with just constructing an n soliton solution and then take the limit. So this is a standard uh, setup. So this is the riemann hebel problem. So we skipped all the direct scattering uh, thing. We already have the spectral data, which are just poles in the upper half plane and the corresponding ones in the lower half plane, like, uh, somewhere here, one of these, one of these blackboards, and uh, we have poles conditions on each of these. Sorry, we have residue conditions on each of each of these poles. Okay, so this was already this this setup was already described by Hirota in seventy one for the KDV and by Wadati in seventy two for the MKDV, and uh, so the, the the residue conditions are given in terms of this chi j, which are the norming constants, and the phases over here, this theta which are, you can see, is they're linear in time and linear in, in space. And then finally, you can recover the, the solution of the MKDV by just solving this, this riemann hebel problem M and just taking the one to entry and you calculate the, the residue at infinity. So this is just standard formula. Okay, so we have M, N of them. We are, don't have any reflection coefficient, so there is no jump on the real line. So we have that. Actually, it turns out that the solution, we can solve it this way, or even better, we can calculate at n by n determinant. So this is just a finite determinant linear algebra sort of thing that we can give to our students to calculate this determinant, take the log, take the x derivative, and then pack it all together. This is your solution. Okay, and this, the, the, the matrix is very explicit. So 
this is finite n. Now we take a lot of them. So we are putting more and more solitons into our pictures. We are rescaling the constants appropriately, like one over n. And we're assuming that the norming constants are discretization of a smooth function R, which is it's regular enough. So here I'm writing real value and positive. Eventually we're going to ask for it to be analytic to, to make every to make the analysis uh, smoother. Uh, so suppose that R is nice enough, and then we take the limit. So in the limit, so remember here we have an n by n determinant. We take the limit. What we find is a thread on the determinant. So this is our first, these are first results. So this solution. The finite n soliton solution converges as n goes to infinity so to this friend of the terminal. And uh, where the integral operator has is very explicit and is given in this form. And you can see that this kernel actually really looks like the finite dimensional n kernel, uh, finite dimensional n matrix, just uh, now it's uh, an integral operator. And of course, the, this, uh, this limit converges uniformly over compact sets of, of x and t. So what is the sketch of the proof? So remember, we are we're starting from an n by n determinant and we end up with a friend on determinant. So how do we take the limit? Well, we do some smart trick where we recast an n by n, friend, an n, by n matrix determinant into a friend on determinant this way. It, we, it turns out that, a matrix, that the matrix A can be written as a composition of two operators and then we just exchange the composition of the operators. And then we take the limit. So here we, have, we already have a friend on determinant and then we take the limit of the integral operator. This is just an, the idea of the proof. So just a few more comments about this formula. So first of all, this is the formula for the free soliton gas for MKDV. Uh, similar formula holds for the KDV soliton gas and for the soliton plus gas solution. So if we add, if we also add the soliton in the picture, the integral operator looks something like that. It's a rank one perturbation of this, of this integral operator, okay? For the case of the defocus in MKDV, Formula, a formula like that was already known. It was derived by tracing Widom in 96. It looks very, very similar. Also the expression of the integral operator and the kernel looks exactly like this, pretty much. I think there is a K minus Z. That's the only difference. And uh, expression like this with Fresno determinants are also very popular nowadays. You can see I'm mentioning some papers from 2020, 2021, 2022. And uh, they arise when they were for solving KPZ equation, like lower tail of KPZ equations, or study friend determinants of a certain class of Hankel composition operators. So there is a lot of interest in this type of formulations, in this type of friend determinants. Uh, so where is the riemann hebel problem in all of this? Uh, we haven't derived it yet, but uh, using some techniques that were developed in, by Bertol and Cafasso in 2012, then we can also recover a riemann hebel problem. And you can see that these are basically two bands where all the poles were accumulating. So it's Already we get the intuition that if we accumulate the poles into these two bands, eventually we recover a full jump. And this is exactly what we have. So we have a riemann hebel problem now that doesn't have poles anymore, it has a jumps along these two intervals with this lower triangular and upper triangular jump matrix. And the phases are still the same. This, this state is still the same as in the finite end case. And uh, the solution of the MKDV equation, this soliton gas solution can still be recovered used, using the user, usual formula that we saw for the finite end solution. And this is a classical solution. So once we assume that R is uh, analytic, then this Q is actually a classical solution to the MKDV equation. So it's continuous, it has derivatives and so on. Okay, again, a few more comments about this riemann hebel problem specific. specific. So this one is, a, is really a soliton gas, is a regular soliton gas, first of all, because we constructed it as a limit of N solitons. And uh, eventually we're gonna see, we're gonna get there that it solves the, the kinetic equations that were described by Zakharov and L. We will get there later. Uh, what, uh, what else we can, we can say about this gas? So this gas, we can, we can call it smooth precisely because we are rescaling the normic constants in a certain way and R is nice enough. So it's, it's a smooth gas. It's a, nice, a well-behaved gas. It's not too crazy. Uh, it's dense because eventually we're gonna see that in the long time asymptotics, the profile, uh, you cannot distinguish uh, bumps in the profiles. So the, all the solitons are really packed together really tight, tightly. And it's deterministic in the sense that once you take the, the n goes going to infinity limit, uh, everything is deterministic. Everything is determined by this function r, which is a given function. There is no randomness anymore in here. Uh, also, this is a special case of what they were called the primitive potentials of Bargman potentials. They were described by Diashenko, Zakharov, and Zakharov in 2016. Uh, they derived this. Um, these potentials using a totally different method, using the dressing method 
and they were describing it via a scalar non-local Riemann Hilbert problem that can be can be adapted into a vector Riemann Hilbert problem or matrix, but uh, it comes from a totally different universe. But these are still solutions of KDV. So, uh, sorry, MKDV. So it's interesting to show that these primitive potential actually are instances of soliton gas. They can be thought as soliton gases. So one of our conjecture is that, so this is only a special case where we have jump matrices that are of this form, so triangular. The full case of the primitive potential actually have jump matrices that are full, the, every entry is non-zero. So this is a totally different class of riemann hilbert problems. Uh, our conjecture is that actually all Bergman potentials are soliton gases, but uh, we still need to um, check that and see actually what sort of gases do we get because then we're gonna have full jump matrices. So that's not, that's uh, kind of unusual. Okay, so once we found the solution, this exact expression for the, for the solution of the MKDV soliton gas, we're focusing on the riemann hilbert problem now. We just discard the Fred on the determinant for now uh, because it's kind of a, it's an object that is not easy to, to study long time asymptotic. So we just focus on the riemann hilbert problem and then we try to get back. Oh, sorry, this should be a cube also here. Okay, so how do we do that? The idea is that we wanna do, uh, we wanna perform the, the so-called Dave Joe C persistent method that was already mentioned by Gerhard. And uh, so this is what happens. So if we only have the soliton gas, the initial profile is step-like, uh, kind of like that picture over there, but what happens is that, well, now it's, uh, it's on the upper half plane, but that's not so important. So the solution is positive, but what is important is that it goes to zero at negative infinity and the plus infinity is oscillatory, right? So it's not, it's not step-like in the sense that I have two constants at minus infinity and at plus infinity. And uh, so here we have what is called, what we call the quiescent region where it's just zero. Then we have something in the middle that is the so-called modulating region that basically connect the zero, uh, the quiescent region with the elliptic region over here where we just have high, oscill high, high oscillations. And uh, so the quiescent region is basically just zero. The modulating and the elliptic region have this form. So you can, you can see here this DN elliptic, uh, Jacobi elliptic function that I mentioned as one of the classical solutions in the periodic, for the periodic elliptic wave. And this is the error term, term of order. The error is of order one over T when you look for large time. So just last comment, this is asymptotically a rarefaction wave. So all, all of this profile moves to the right. So you have a rarefaction wave that T goes to infinity. You're gonna see some, some video shortly. So how do, we, how do we prove this whole picture? So this is what we have, but how do we get there? So the idea is that we study the phases in the jump, this data that I already showed you before. And the idea is that depending on this uh, fraction X over T, we are in different regimes. So if X over T is small enough, then these exponentials here have imaginary part that is uh, positive. So, and remember there is an I in front of the theta. So then everything becomes exponentially small. So uh, you have E to the minus something that goes to infinity to minus infinity. So everything is exponentially small, we're in the quiescent region. So there is no contribution from any of the jumps. Then when X over T is between these two values, so I have four eta one and then this V critical, which it, it can be computed is just, uh, it's an implicit solution of the Witta modulation equation. Uh, then we are in some sort of uh, in-between region, we're in the modulating region. And this is where we have the periodic traveling way with slowly very parameter alpha. So this alpha here, if you see in this picture, these are the jumps. So the, the top part is where we are in the quiescent region. So the jumps really do not contribute. That's why they're dashed. And then at some point, if we move X over T a little bit bigger, then we start recovering part of the jumps over here. So this gives a contribution. And this end point here, this dot, is really this alpha that pops up. So alpha is a number between I eta one, which is the lower end point, and I eta two, which is the upper end points and is given by solving the Witta modulation equation. And then finally, once I push X over T really big, then we are recovering the full jump in our riemann hilbert problem. And we have a periodic, periodic traveling wave with no fixed parameters. So this alpha here is just theta two and uh, it doesn't grow anymore. So just to show you a quick video. So this is the Witta modulation equation that we need to solve. So X over T is equal to this value. And basically we need to invert this equation to find the alpha. But I have here a little video just to show you how it works. So up here, up here you have this, what I call Xi, which is the X over T that I am just shifting up and down along this, this curve. And down here you see how you recover 
Uh, let me let me start again. Okay, so the alpha starts at iota one and minus iota one, and then it moves it moves towards iota two and minus iota two, and then eventually it it fans out. It just disappears. You can see that the alpha here, and then eventually when psi is bigger than this critical value, the alpha is just over here. It keeps on moving away, but that we don't care about that anymore. We just stop at i eta two and we recover the full jump. So this is just to show you how it works when you're moving x over t, how the whole jumps evolve. So once we know how to divide the, 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 the asymptotic into these three regions, then finally we can use this steepest descent business. So we basically introduce what is called the G function that has to cure the parts of the jumps that are asymptotically big. The G function has, um, it has many expressions in our paper. This is the ones that we like the most because it's a logarithmic integral with respect to some density rho uh, that is completely explicit over here. And you can see that the rho depends uh, on X and T, depends also on the alpha, which is implicitly depending on X and T, depends on the endpoints. And there are two constants here, C C2 and C0, that are uni uniquely determined by this constraint, okay? And the F is just uh, some other function that will take care of the function R that we have in our Riemann-Hilbert problem. So don't worry about that. Uh, we also define the wave phase phi, uh, which right now is also important, but it's gonna be important when we wanna study the, the kinetic equations. So once we introduce the G function, this is what we have. So for, all right, sorry. Once we introduce the G function, then everything follows uh, kind of standard. We solve the Riemann-Hilbert problem, the, this new Riemann-Hilbert problem T, that is basically something like this. We have constant jumps here and here, and here we have exactly this e to the i delta, where delta depends on x over t. Okay, and so the solution is gonna be, be given in terms of theta functions, which can be combined together to actually get this, uh, this conoidal wave, this elliptic wave, both in the modulated case and in the fixed case. So now what happens if we add a big solitons over here, right? So we, we initialize the solitons in the far left, so that is not interacting with the gas just yet. But uh, first of all, we initialize it very big so that it's faster, it's gonna catch up with the gas. And, uh, and then we wanna see what happens. So what's the interaction? How does the whole solution look like? And so on. So this is the initial profile. And uh, this, is the this is how the Riemann-Hilbert problem looks like. So here we have the two bands, that's the gas. And here we have up here a uh, pole, I kappa naught, and uh, another pole down here, I kappa naught. So the fact that we put it up here is because we want the, the soliton to be big, faster than the gas. So that's why it's up here. And then the idea is that this, this chi that we also need to determine, this chi is very big because we wanted to initialize it at the very, on the very far left. So this is, so this is very big. So it, we put it on the left. Uh, but then the, at, when time evolves, of course, it's gonna catch up with the gas. So, so this is the new Riemann-Hilbert problem that we need to solve. And uh, so we can, we can still recycle our G function that we had for when we just had the gas. And so we still, so the, the XT plane gets still uh, tripartite into three parts. We still have the decay, the, 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 the quiescent region. We still have the modulated elliptic wave in some region and then the, the, the fixed elliptic wave. What happens is that when the soliton is there, well, things get a little bit more exciting because each of these region, it's also, Further, furthermore divided into an S plus and an S minus region. So the S minus is where the soliton has already passed. So the S minus is all this region here. And the S plus is where the soliton hasn't passed yet. So here the, the particles in the gas are still awaiting for, for the solitons over here. And why is that important? Precisely because after the soliton passes, there is gonna be some phase shift and some interaction that happens. So we need to basically solve two Riemann-Hilbert problems at the same time before the soliton passes and after the soliton passes, and then calculate the phase shift. So this is what happens. So in this, this part, is just the solitons. Nothing very exciting is happening. The soliton gas is moving on its own. The soliton is moving and it's catching up. And the Riemann-Hilbert problem can be easily solved. There is no contribution from these bands. There is only the contribution from the two poles at I kappa naught and minus kappa naught, which is this, this bump. So this is easy. But now we get to the elliptic region. So now that's when the soliton enters the region, enters the gas. So first of all, uh, just a quick comment that the edge of the soliton is propagating a speed for eta one squared, right? So while the, while the soliton, this is the soliton gas velocity at the edge. 
while the soliton, the soliton itself has velocity for kappa naught square, which is much bigger. So one, one, I once, I, once I'm in the modulating region, then I have, or in the, or in the elliptic region, what we need to do is introduce the G function, which is the same one, open lenses, which is another standard technique to solve the riemann hilbert problem, and then define finally the model problem. And these are the two, these are the two cases where we have to keep track of the minus when the soliton is not there yet, and the plus where the soliton has already passed. And in the plus case, we need to reverse triangularity. We need to do some extra tricks to, to take care, to be able to solve the, Riemann, the, the model problem, the riemann hilbert model problem, and calculate the phase shift. Okay, so let me just show you how the model problem looks like, which is basically what, what Carol already put over here. So this is our model problem. We factor it as, this, as one part that is gonna take care of the poles and one part that is gonna take care of the bands. For the bands, we have this uh, two-sheet Riemann surface that Gera was mentioning. Uh, we compute the, the cycles, the A and the B cycles, and we manage to find an explicit solution for the model problem in terms of Riemann theta function, sorry, Jacobi theta functions. And the W sol is the one that is taking care of the poles. You see that I have a contribution here from a pole at I kappa naught, a contribution here from the pole at minus I kappa naught. And the, the coefficients here are pretty explicit. You can compute them uh, explicitly by just imposing the residue conditions. Okay, so once we have our model problem, well, there is, uh, there is still some problem at, uh, at the endpoints where the model problem is not such a good approximation, but this can be, this can be fixed. We just introduced some local parametrices there. We put some patches. And uh, the Bessel here are Bessel parametrices at I1, I eta 1 and minus I eta 1. At the other endpoint, we may have Bessel or area depending if we are in the modulated or not modulated region. But in any case, everything is very explicit. We can fix that. And then finally, we have the error problem. So this, this error times model problem was the T that we had originally. That's the G function, that's the F, and this is the X, which is gonna give a solution to the, to the MKDD. So once we have that, the error here is gonna give us what's the order of approximation, and this is what happens. So you see here that the soliton is passing through the gas. Very funnily, it's going up and down. So the interaction is, is really non-trivial. So not only speeding up, here I don't, I don't have a, a comparison with the free soliton passing, to free soliton moving in the vacuum, but the soliton is actually faster. And the peak is actually going up and down. So it's also oscillating, the peak itself, the peak of the soliton. Uh, can we describe this in a, in a more detailed way? We can. So, well, first of all, these are still some, some uh, pictures that show how the peak is oscillating. You can see here, this is the position and it's oscillating. Then this is the velocity. So this is the picture that I was showing you earlier. So this is the highly oscillations that the velocity of the soliton is, uh, is going through as it's passing through the gas. Okay, so these are just pictures. These are just, this is just numerics. Can we actually quantify this thing more, more precisely? And um, we're going to. Let me just show you first the theorem that shows that the full solution of the soliton plug gas, it's actually the sum of these two contributions. One is the background wave, which is exactly this elliptic wave that we already recovered in the case where there is no soliton. And then there is this QSO that as I told you, doesn't really look like a hyperbolic secant squared. It's all implicitly defined in terms of this Q and this axis, which uh, they can be written in terms of this function F, the phase phi, which is basically the G function and the theta functions. Uh, the Jacobi theta functions. So it can be written explicitly, it's just very ugly and it wouldn't fit the slide, but uh, it's there, it can be calculated. So this QSO, yeah. Okay, I have a question about clarification. Yeah. So you've been discussing products as P equals to plus infinity, right? Yeah. So how can you have both regions in the limit P equals to plus infinity? It seems like one of the regions, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding something. Uh, if you go back to the slide where you yeah. had the definition of the- This one? Yes. So it seems like as p equals to plus infinity, I always have s minus. How can I see as the region as plus as p equals to plus infinity? Uh, you need to go. You need to go very far. This is just a uh, small. But but I only see it when c is larger than the speed of the, or is larger than the outside the modulated region. Isn't that right? Uh, let me think. Because the salt alone is as plus, right? Correct, that's what I'm saying. In other words, you see as plus in the, in the limit equals to infinity, 
only for the C only for the schemes that are faster than the than the leading edge of the of the modulator with the two phase. I'm confused. I'm sorry, I don't mean to. No, no, no. Um, now I'm confused too. So this this was my do-it-yourself picture. So it could have some flaws. My understanding is that so you initialize the solid on here. This is where the gas is. That this is the word. Basically, this, there is no support over here, and the soliton is starting to travel. So, if you just follow the solitons, you see that the soliton is at some point entering the gas, and then it's just staying trapped inside the the gas, and it just continues on its own. Um, oh, you're probably right. Um, I can start, but that's the shift, right? That's the initial shift. That's where I'm, put, I'm putting the sorry. Yeah, that's the chi. But then it's not an asymptotic that three goes to plus infinity. That's why I'm confused. So anyway, I'm sorry. Maybe we can discuss this later. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I. Not explicitly, but we definitely do because all the, they're all large parameters. So the, the chi is very large. So the soliton is very much in the left and the T is also very large. So we are moving the solitons towards the gas. So yeah, they're all coupled. They're all large parameters. So, right. This, we were here. Right. So yeah, we, we're, we can definitely get back to it. So just uh, finishing up, there is still have a few minutes. So this is the expression of the soliton, the contribution from the soliton, uh, although it doesn't really look like, but let me give you some extra finer details. So first of all, the phase shift that I keep on mentioning where the soliton passes through the gas, we can actually compute it explicitly. So this is the phase shift that the gas is receiving from the soliton as it's passing by. This is some negative quantity. So the gas is actually shifted towards the left. Then this is what I call giant turbo soliton. So imagine the soliton is really ginormous and it's extremely fast. So then, so then this Q sol actually simplifies. So in the asymptotic as kappa naught goes to infinity, you can recover this hyperbolic secant. That's, that's the usual one soliton solution that we know for MKDV. And these order one terms are just some residues. That doesn't, doesn't matter because this kappa naught is the one that wins over everything. And then we can even get better estimates if we're assuming that this function R that I said is very nice and it's uh, the one that is uh, appearing in the jumps. So if it vanishes or blows up like a square root at the endpoints, so basically we don't need to introduce local parametrices at the endpoints. So the error term becomes even better in the elliptic region. So only when we have the full jump, not when we have the alpha that is moving in between. So this, so here we get even a better estimate. So basically, this theorem becomes Q background plus Q sol plus exponentially small term in the elliptic region. So we even have a better uh, description of the gas. And so this is the full picture. So this should be correct, Gino. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So here you can see the soliton. This is the, the, the yellow line that is traveling through the gas. The green dashed line is when the soliton is free. So you can see that there is a deviation because the soliton is interacting with the gas. And um, this is and this is just the, the color map. So you can see the height of, of the soliton and the gas. And it's a full description over the whole spatial domain and for T large. So finally, so let, let me talk about the velocity. So I, want, I wanted to, sh to kind of uh, explain better what this picture looks like. And if we can actually draw a formula, find a formula that describes it, these oscillations of the velocities. So there are several velocities that we need to take care, care of, that we need to introduce. So first of all, let me recall the G function. That's the one that sort of drives the dynamics. So it's sort of like the, the protagonist in our Riemann Hilbert analysis. So the G function is defined as a logarithm, integral of the logarithm times some, in, some density, let's call it density, rho. And I'm also recalling the phase, the wave phase, which is just the G function plus the phase that was already there in our Riemann Hilbert problem. So now the first thing that we define is the phase velocity, right? So, which is basically minus, is basically the ratio between the frequency and the, and the, and the wave number, as we always learn from when we solve uh, the standard wave equation. 
So from this, velocity, from this phase velocity, we can calculate the elliptic wave velocity, which is the velocity of the envelope as it's moving and is equal to this quantity over here. You can see that when alpha depends on X over T. So the velocity of the envelope depends whether you are in the modulated region or in the elliptic region. You are gonna have different, different values over here. And then you can calculate these average soliton velocities, which is this velocity of the phase evaluated at the poles. And you can see here that you have the contribution from the, from the elliptic wave. You have this kappa naught square, which is the velocity of the soliton itself, and then it's modulated because you have some elliptic function that appears here. So this is one velocity, but also we have the group velocity, which is the velocity of the wave packet inside the soliton, the soliton gas, which is this ratio over here, where now we don't, we don't use the wave phase anymore, we use the, the density itself. And it's again explicit, very explicit. So the first, the first result is that, what's the velocity of the soliton gas itself, where it solves this implicit equation, which is exactly the kinetic equation that was described by Gennady and Zakharov. You see that you have V group here and V group here in, on both sides of the equation. I'm not writing the continuity equation because it's trivially satisfied in this case, so there is nothing to check. So this is for the soliton gas. What about the soliton itself? So for the soliton, we can say a lot of things. So we want to, first of all, track the position of the solitons, basically where the peak is. So the first thing is that, well, when we're in the quiescent region, the peaks evolves linearly as it's expected with velocity kappa naught squared. But when we're in the elliptic regions, then the position of the peaks can be described by this implicit equation. So it's a solution of this implicit equation where you can see again these functions q and x that are described in terms of the theta function. And, oops, and we can also calculate the, the value of the solution at the peak. So this is, this is where, so all the, all, the, all the videos actually are evaluating this, this quantity if we wanna track the peak, the position of the peak. And uh, just one note, kappa naught has to be large enough. Otherwise, this is what happens. So if the, if the soliton is not big enough at some point as it's passing through the gas, we get something that we get two peaks. So we sort of lost track of the solitons. So that's why, and the problem is really that we are looking for a solution of this implicit equation. If kappa naught, kappa naught is not large enough, we don't find a solution. Well, we find a multi-value solution so that we don't, we don't know which one is the soliton anymore and which one is the gas. So this is good only when we have a, a large soliton passing through the gas. That's why originally I was suggesting to call the paper Gulliver and Lilliputian, but it didn't go through. So we didn't post it on the archive with that name. And this is what happens, right? Exactly, this is some discontinuities that you find precisely when the soliton is not big enough, you don't know where the soliton is in some, at some time, at some specific times. So what happens with the velocity? So once we know how to track the, the position of the solitons, we just take the derivative pretty much. And this is the velocity of the peak. So you can find here this phi t over phi x, which really looks like this wave velocity that I was describing before, but then there are some extra terms over here. This log derivative of a function psi, which can be described explicitly, it's highly oscillatory. So this is where all the oscillations come from, from the picture that I showed you before. And then there are smaller order terms because we're still doing asymptotics. What's, what's interesting is that, so what about this V bar sol that I showed you before and, that, and I define it as like the average soliton velocity? Well, it is indeed an average soliton velocity if you average the true velocity over a period. So the soliton is passing through the gas, the gas is highly oscillatory. If you average it over one period in the gas, then you recover this average soliton velocity within the gas. So this is one result that connects this average velocity with the true velocity. And why do we care about this so much? Well, because this V bar sol, it's actually the one that solves Zakharov and L kinetic equations. So you can see here that that's exactly this logarithmic integral and that the four kappa naught square is the velocity of the soliton. So here again is the picture. Now, this is a comparison between the true velocity, which is the blue line, and the black line is the average. It's this V bar sol that you see is very, very, uh, very regular. So just to give an idea of the proof very quickly. So the idea is that we're in the elliptic region. So then there is a G function that we need to take care of. And we have the poles of the solitons that we have to take care of. So you see the phi here has the G function and these are the new residue conditions of the poles. So the first intuition is that the small residue conditions are negligible. So whenever this is small, there is no soliton there. Or whenever this is large, there is no soliton there. So we're just looking at positions in the XT plane where this quantity here is over the one. 
that's where we can identify the position of the solitons in our Riemann Hilbert world. And uh, the second intuition is that if we look at the background, the background looks exactly like an elliptic wave. And it seems like the, the, the main, the main uh, feature of the background is this sum, omega plus delta, which are quantity that dep depends on x and t. So the idea is that what if we do a change of variables, change of coordinates instead of x and t, we define these new variables, which are basically omega plus delta, and the time is still the same. So basically we're anchoring ourselves to the gas as we're changing frame or we're changing frame of reference. We're anchoring ourselves to the gas and then we're waiting until the soliton passes through us, right? So it's like, I'm actually following, let's say this little dot and I'm waiting and letting the time pass until I finally see the big guy passing through me. And that's when I can identify the soliton. Voila, it has passed. So this is where we managed to identify the peak. And well, this is like some technical details. The idea is that this is where the solution of the soliton peak comes from, this in implicit equation. And this Q minus that I told you it's very explicit, it is very explicit, it's this, it's this thing over here. The gamma is some quartic root at the endpoints. You see a, some slowly evolving envelope, this dn, there is another dn over here. Uh, there is no minus here. And the x, also is very explicit. So I just wanted to blast you with this, with this uh, formula just to show you that everything is still very explicit, although it seems like I'm cheating because I'm not showing the formula. Uh, just to complete the picture, then we have an implicit solution that can be written, an implicit equation that can be written like that. We solve it and we get back to the, we identify the global maximum in the sense that we get back to the physical coordinate X and T by just using some implicit function theorem, you know, Cal3 sort of thing, easy. And then we, by differentiating this implicit expression, we can also get the velocity. That's where you see that here you have this log of psi, which is the one that is oscillatory. That's where we find that the, the x dot peak, the velocity is oscillatory. That's where the contribution comes from. And that's it. So just to give you some overall conclusion. So we, we gave a full description of the soliton gas and of the soliton plus gas in the large time regime. So we gave a rigorous really description of how a particle, the soliton, interacts with a medium, which is the gas. Uh, this was all observed before in numerical experiments, but this is actually a rigorous proof. So we have, we have rigorous formula in the large time regime, and we see how both the soliton and the gas interact between each other. So the gas gets a shift, the soliton gets accelerated, and we can quantify that. And then I, I want to stress this out again, because we call it soliton gas, but there is no randomness, unfortunately, not yet at least. Uh, what is interesting is that still the interaction dynamics is governed by this kinetic equation described by Gennady L and collaborators where there is some randomness in, in, their, in their study. So still um, it fits into the whole global picture. So what's next? Well, so clearly we can cook up other configuration of regular gases, MKDV as breathers, for example, or what happens when we have two gases or more gases well, ideally, how our, our intuition is that we're going to have two bands instead of just one band in the upper half plane and the corresponding two in the lower half planes. But who knows what sort of solution you get over there. Uh, what happens if you have a tracer solitons and a gas? So a tracer is a soliton that has smaller velocity and maybe it's like maybe stays trapped into the gas or maybe never reaches the gas. Well, that's the easy configuration, but or maybe gets bounced back by a gas. So what happens if you have a soliton like that? Can we inject randomness? So we have a truly random soliton gas. Uh, here I mentioned non-smooth gases. So in, when we take the limit when n goes to infinity, we, we assume some strong conditions on the norming constants, the way we were scaling them, and this, be, this existence of this function R that was uh, appearing in the limit. So what happens if R is not so nice, or if these norming constants are not scaled like one over n? So maybe, maybe we're going to have more like a fractal gas. Who knows? I'm just, I'm just saying uh, random words over here. And then finally, something that could be numerically challenging. Uh, we have an exact formula for the solution. We just, uh, so far, it's hard to plot it in a computer because there are lots of exponentially big terms, exponentially small terms. So it needs a very careful numerical evaluation in order to plot something from the exact formula. So all the pictures that you saw are from the asymptotic behavior that we can actually just use Mathematica or MATLAB to plot. The Fresnel determinant itself is another beast. So that could be interesting to also see uh, the actual solution of the soliton gas from this exact formula. And with this, I thank you. And I finish here.
Thank you. Uh, any questions? There were some already. Hey, thanks for your very nice talk. Just to make sure that I understood what you're doing correctly. Uh, do I, yeah, so your background solution is basically a step in some sense, zero on the left and yeah. the elliptic function on, on the right. And then that means, of course, your, the, your, your extra soliton on the spectral side would just be an eigenvalue inside the first band, which is of multiplicity one, right? The extra soliton? Yeah. No, the extra soliton is outside. We put it outside. Uh, let me yeah, yeah, I understand that uh, in in the x direction it's it's outside, but your your pole will be on on the band, right? No, the pole is outside the band. Let me show you. Here, the pole is up here. Ah, because okay, yeah, oh, okay. I see, I see. So it's it's really fast and big. Okay, then. So that's why I was. So this is what is uh, in the literature. Yeah. Alex and Gennady, they call it trial soliton because it's outside the band. And the question, the next step would be what happens if it's inside the band? That's the tracer soliton. Okay, I see. Because I'm just a little bit, but maybe I'm just confusing myself why then it's traveling in the other direction if it's below the spectrum. But ah, what happens okay. if it's here? Yeah, that's another question. We maybe haven't you. studied that yet. Okay, uh, okay, I see. Yeah, I agree. It's an interesting question what happens when it's on, on the spectrum because you somehow need to separate this. Okay, thank you. One more question. Uh, so I have a question uh, about unimerics. How are you doing unimerics? Is that you're just solving Cauchy problem by some numerical method or you use inverse scattering? The, this numerics? Yeah. yeah. This is uh, Mathematica and we just plotted uh, this, uh, this thing. So this is the long time asymptotics. Yeah. So all the pictures are long time, long time asymptotics. So these are what well, functions that are built in Mathematica, so we just- put Ah, so, so you're not solving direct numerics, you just use these formulas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So that's why, so we would love to take this Riemann, this uh, Fredon determinant that it's here and plot this. We haven't succeeded yet. We were trying to use Bornemann's technique, but uh, it, was, it was not working very well. So they need some extra thinking. We haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it would be good also to do direct numerics, you know, not relying on inverse scattering. Sure. No, no, I, I mean, of course, it's not periodic problem, so it will be extra challenge. And another elementary question, when this soliton slows down, is that kind of constant deceleration, at least for not very large times, when it goes through this the to soliton, the right, yeah. The soliton slows down? Yeah, you show it that it slows down, right? It It, it, it goes faster. Ah, it's faster. It, yeah, it goes faster. You can see... It, you, you showed plot time dependence. It was two, two lines, free soliton and... Yeah. Ah, yeah, it was... Okay, okay, it's accelerating. Yeah, you're right. And is that constant yes. acceleration or not? Uh, acceleration, we didn't... Uh, you, I, I guess this is the dumb... Ah, yeah, yeah, it was... You just pass this picture. Yeah, this you just pass it. Yeah, yeah, this is the gas. It's not the soliton. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this yeah. One. One is free soliton, another is soliton in the gas, right? Yes. yes. So there are two, there are some slopes. Are they, you know, in the gas is that just uh, it, it's, velocity is changing, right? So it's yeah. compared to, so is that constant acceleration or not? Or it's a, uh, No, it's not constant because, uh, so. At least there moderate there, times, of course, for a very large time eventually. Yeah, exactly. Because so in the in the elip, in the modulated case, the velocity changes and also the accelerator changes. And then when you are in the elliptic case, then it becomes constant. But so it's a it's a little bit. You can see in this picture, where is it? So you see that here the velocity is modulated and then it becomes constant, but it's still highly oscillatory. So so the acceleration keeps on changing as well. Yeah, but if you look kind of envelope, but of several we could find yeah then like if you average it then it becomes constant mm -hmm. okay thank you one more question at the back uh,
uh, that's uh, that's where we were thinking that there might be two gases there, and then there could be more more gaps. More, sorry, more bands, and then yeah, it's a. Uh, who knows what happens? You might get genus two solution, genus three, more. Yeah. Maybe one last question, if there is one. No, we can thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. You've had a situation where your sultan goes through the